the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. We need to be able to engage and not move towards writing someone off and assuming that they're uneducated and uninformed with a blanket accusation like, you're a socialist, end of conversation. You're a racist, end of conversation. Social media, of course, exaggerates the trends towards those unfiltered, knee-jerk responses, kind of verbal tyranny, if you will. And I think this is where both the right and the left need to calm down. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. In history, there are turning points. There are forks in the road that make all the difference in the world. And, you know, we've talked over and over about our economy uh, being run by worldwide, actually, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was uh, founded on and run by a gold standard, which was implied discipline. Uh, You had to balance your payments over time. And then, of course, they changed it a little bit in the 1920s. We went to a different type of standard, gold exchange standard. And then, of course, uh, by 1971, we went through Bretton Woods in the 40s. And then, you know, up to 1971, we finally just lost the gold thing altogether. But that was a major fork in the road. Remember you bought for me the book Monetary Sin of the West, which was published right before that fork was taken? That's right. Jacques Rouve was trying to make the case to Charles de Gaulle that there was issues with uh, the U.S. and the U.S. dollar. And he had been a, a young man in, in Britain just before the pound sterling devaluation, pretty massive sterling devaluation. And so as an older man with some experience, uh, was trying to get the ear of de Gaulle. De Gaulle wouldn't listen for whatever reason. And so he started publishing things to Le Monde, the, the popular magazine, uh, daily newspaper in, in, in Paris. And that got de Gaulle's attention over it, time it because did. it made sense. What Jacques Rouffe was saying made sense. As soon as the people were paying attention, the politician had to as well. So. Right. He he had had to play a little bit political uh, in order to get in de Gaulle's ear. Ultimately, he did. And the monetary center of the West is kind of the the description of what's happening throughout the late 50s, early 60s. And what Jacques Rouff sees is a deteriorating financial circumstance for the United States. One of the chapters, chapter four, is a, a copy of de Gaulle's press conference where he's calling for a European Union, but in a different way. He's talking about how, as we've seen the move away from the gold standard uh, to the gold exchange standard, it's really ruined the economies. And even though the U.S. dollar was still exchanging for gold, he saw the end of that line. And so what he was calling for, this press conference that he gave, He was calling for Europe to go back to the gold standard that they had before 1914, before World War One. And how different would the world have been if we would have gone back to an all out gold standard instead of going off of the gold standard? Look at the inequalities that we see in society right now. A lot of that's based on some people being able to print their own money and others have to earn it. Yeah. No, we know the world as it is, not as it could have been. And so there could have been a number of things that uh, we didn't like as a consequence of the gold standard, things that we enjoy today because of the excesses in the system. Yeah, household net worth has never been higher, um, stretching towards $120 trillion. And, you know, so there's those things that we think, well, we could have that too, right? Well, probably not. I mean, we would be dealing with a smaller dollar, would buy more, um, but our net worth, everyone's would be a, a little tremor, I think. You know, the timing of this book is I hold it, you know, I'm holding this book while we talk and I, I love it. It's all marked up, but there's a quote uh, by Henri de Motherland. I think I'm saying his name probably wrong, but it <laughs> says in the beginning, it says, There is a tragedy in the world because men contrive out of nothings tragedies that are totally unnecessary, which means that men are frivolous. Now, we record this program a week before the election. There are very, very strong feelings right now, Dave, and a lot of people feel like we are at another fork in the road. We could either break right or break left, but it's going to be a break. Yeah, and I think the vast majority of Americans have strong feelings about the elections next week, but they're not inclined. The majority of them are not inclined to tantrums if they don't get their way. And and I mean, really outright violence. And there's no doubt there's going to be unrest by the end of next week in a handful of cities and states. 
um, because there are a minority of people who really do feel that strongly. Um, but, you know, this notion of, of the preconditions for civil war uh, being in play. Do you think that's being trumped up by media or just the so, small minority? Certainly the mainstream media loves drama, and I don't think the preconditions for civil war are there. You look at comments from political scientists, um, you know, James Fearon from Stanford, He's been writing on the subject for a long time, and national poverty is an important precondition for civil war. Other scholars uh, look and say that, you know, the vast majority of cases in the 20th century hinge on sort of capturing or trying to, to, to take over a concentrated economic resource, whether it's diamonds or oil or, you know, the drug crops in Colombia, uh, where there's a scramble for the control of an asset and sort of violence meets politics for a concentrated gain. So, you know, the, the precedents would suggest otherwise. You do have people like Peter Tertian. He's a, uh, an anthropologist um, who makes the case that inequality creates more and more political stress and that could lend itself towards uh, civil war. And, and, and again, he says it's stagnating wages. It's too many college graduates and not enough jobs. It's exploding public debt. It's a widening gap between the elites with monopoly market positions and and the deteriorating conditions for uh, for those in the middle class. And and he says that you should not blame Trump, which I think is interesting. Um, he just argues that the structural causes for this kind of political stress pre-existed and have been within the system for years. And all Trump does is sort of throw matches to the to the the fuel, if you will. Um, he magnifies these these stresses in the in the present political context. Well, when you talk about stress, a lot of people don't know why they're stressed. They just know they are I mean, the the system itself in a free market system. A lot of stress is eliminated, even though businesses are allowed to fail in a free market system and some others succeed. There's a knowledge of what's going on. But when you really do have the inequality of a group of people who can print money and inflate the system, devalue, devalue the currency, it creates stresses and it actually forces people to become gamblers. People who, you know, 70, 75, 80 year old people who are retired they're feeling a stress that they have to make enough money to be able to make the bills for that month with the assets that they stored maybe away 20 years ago. The quote that you mentioned from the Monetary Center of the West, that opening quote, um, it does remind me that one of the big decisions uh, that's important here is the impact of monetary policy. Yeah. Um, I mean, what if we had that sort of restructured society as we know it? Artificially lower rates simultaneously boosts asset prices. And you're right, it turns everybody into sort of the scrambling gambler. And if you don't have assets, then you're kind of the frustrated non-participant sitting on the sidelines watching the game play, and you're not in it. So I think to some degree, the Robinhood investment app is is an indication both of easy money on the one hand and sort of the, the flimsy bull market dynamics, which that easy money promotes but also kind of a desperation, hmm. a desperation to catch up financially. People who don't have enough in the game and, and would like more. And so make a haul as fast as you can. And, you know, the, the monetary mandarins are, they're doing more than just monetary policy and an increase in the money supply. It's fascinating to see here as we get towards the end of a cycle, it's becoming believed that whether it's the ECB, or the Fed, that we can solve all problems if we just print a little bit more money. So climate change is quickly becoming on the list of things to do by the world's central bankers. Inclusion issues, again, on the list of things to do by the world central bankers. And apparently, more money is all that you need. Okay, but you talk about these, these various institutions. Confidence, we may not be going towards civil war yet. But the confidence in these big institutions is waning, is it not? I mean, we're, we're people at this point are looking up and going, can they really hold this thing together for forever? And are they creating the problem that's stressing me out? And I think that's what most academics do agree on, whether it's um, unrest, civil unrest or civil war, there being a, a pretty big difference between the two. And, it, and, you know, there is an agreement that institutions and the confidence that the average man has or woman has in institutions that is waning at the popular level. And you, you can see it as you've looked through The Economist in the last year, the magazine out of London, that The Economist has bemoaned the death of the international liberal order. And of course, they don't like Trump's uh, contribution to that. 
But whether it's Congress, and we mentioned the very low ratings uh, that Congress has gotten in recent uh, months, you also have the question over the legitimacy of courts. You've got the question of, you know, the role that the IMF and the World Bank plays, good, bad. They're considered uh, experts. You. They're considered experts. It's a little bit like leave it. You know, you've said this many times, leave it to the PhDs. But you're saying that tongue in cheek because the PhDs, they want you to believe that they have it under control. Dave, the times that you've actually talked to them on this commentary they're much more humble. They're like, no, no, we we don't know as much as you guys think we know. Well, and I think that was one of the things that was impressive about the gentleman from the Bank of England who joined us um, earlier this year. Yeah, Tucker. Yeah, and he basically said, look, if we have a mandate that's too broad, you understand that there's the opportunity for politics to play nasty with us, against us. We may find us our, ourselves out of a job if we allow for overreach in terms of our mandates, let's just do what we're supposed to do and not try to solve everyone's problems. So I, I think there's actually a lot that hangs in the balance here, whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, um, even central banks, you know, to a degree, at least for me, there there is um, this appeal of, of, of leaving it to the experts, uh, which rings hollow. And to the degree that we do depend on the experts, there's also the opportunity in here for there to be a disappointment of expectations. Okay, so it's not civil war, but it is civil unrest at this point. Yeah, exactly. And I think that this is where, again, disappointed people take to the streets and for whatever reason, they may be disappointed. And if you go back to our June podcast, I think it was first week of June, we had the podcast, The Late Not So Great 1968. Mm -hmm. And we talked about what civil unrest was about, why it was coming at the end of a cycle. Uh, 1968 was the end of a bull market cycle. 1949 to 1968 had been one heck of a bull run, capturing the post-war pent-up demand. And, of course, there was a, a pretty big expansion of money and credit. You had the war period and Johnson's guns and butter policies, all of this sort of factoring into expansion. And, of course, by today's standards, the credit expansion back in the 60s was minuscule. Well, and that, that's when Jacques Roof was writing this material and saying, look, we've got a fork in the road coming. Let's go back to a gold standard. We didn't do that. But like you said, by today's standards, could you imagine if Jacques Roof were alive right now, what would he be writing? I think he would be shocked. I think anyone of his ilk would say, frankly, this is beyond imaginable. Mm. So by 68, it was our foreign creditors who had noticed what we were doing, and they started calling the loans. And I, I think everyone recalls the 1971 Nixon ending of the Bretton Woods uh, monetary system and, and closing the gold window, and discontinuing dollar convertibility to gold. But it was in 1968 that we were, as a country, we were making threats to our creditors. And we were defining the terms of friendship by those that would continue to take the quickly inflating currency and payment of debt rather than the second choice, which was an agreed upon option. You could take gold bullion or you could take greenbacks. And we started to say, but if you're our friend, of course, you'll take the greenbacks. Yeah, and Jacques Roof had been through this cycle back with Britain before he was with France. Which right? was his whole point to yeah. the goal, which is you may want to be friends with the Americans, but you're going to get hosed. My suggestion is you take the gold, not the greenbacks. And he knew it was the end of the cycle. Yeah, he knew it was the end of the cycle. And sure enough, a uh, big devaluation occurred. The French knew we were at the end of the cycle and things got crazy, not only in terms of policy desperation, but also deterioration in international relations, a real stress on these international bodies. Again, sort of, again, that this, this pressure on and confidence in institutions. Think, think about the riots that you had in Paris in 1969. This was an expression of discontent with all institutions. Right. And so this is not like we haven't seen it before. And, you know, it was street level organization of riots and unrest, but also the end of of a trend in in terms of the markets. No surprise. The bull that began in 1949 ended 1968. So there are times there are times when you can make a lot of money, possibly at the end of a cycle or you can do what Barton Biggs did. 
and write a book and just say, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to stock my wine cellar. <laughs> I'm going to buy some gold and I'm going to get out in the woods and I'm just going to go ahead and settle in on the last few years of my retired life. Sit on the front porch in my rocking chair. <laughs> we read that book too. Shot, yeah. Shotgun over. I mean, I, he yeah. basically implied, yeah, shotgun yeah. resting over your lap. Just a few friendly shots over the front gate if anybody decides they're curious about what's behind it. Well, and you were with the company that Barton Biggs was with for many years. Right, right. He was one of the Morgan Stanley moguls. Now, I, I think you can ignore the end of the cycle dynamics and run with momentum. And there's plenty of people doing that. And Robin Hood's a good expression of sort of the last gasp of momentum traders. Or you can quietly exit, find your place of peace somewhere on God's green earth. A little like Barton Biggs did. And just yeah. kind of see what happens next and let it pass by. So, okay. So what we talk about on unrest, it's not as if there are not people who benefit from the unrest. Uh, partisanship. Partisanship actually plays a key role in political uh, success. Yeah, and I'm not saying a political environment and social environment are not nasty. Um, just not nasty enough at this point to make for the move from civil unrest to civil war. Our commentary guest in a few weeks, uh, Justin McBrayer, points to Nathan Calmo, I think who's at LSU, and, and Liliana Mason's research on radical partisanship. Mm. And currently almost half of people who self-identify as Republican or Democrat view those in the opposing party as being evil. So it's not just a discussion. This is actually a moral judgment call. Right. And there's not a lot of space for dialogue or old fashioned debate on the issues when someone is evil, not just someone who disagrees with you, but someone who is defined as the embodiment of evil. So a fifth, according to their research, a fifth of partisans think of political opponents as less than human. Which I think is, I mean, isn't wow. that fascinating? Because when you think about what happens at the extremes, and again, you go back to how people justify certain actions against other people, and it's usually by dehumanizing them. Yeah. It's usually by dehumanizing them. Yeah, but you're talking 20% of the people that were polled believe that the other side is less than human. Less than 20 human. 20% of them. Wow. 16% of Republicans, I thought this was fascinating, and 20% of Democrats think the country would be better off if large numbers of their opponents died. And nearly the same percentages thought that violence would be justified if their candidate lost the 2020 election. So here we are in the 21st century and we're <laughs> looking at ourselves. I mean, how barbarous. Well, and, but I mean, we're supposed to be civilized, right? I thought our public schools were encouraging and teaching tolerance. I, I mean, isn't that kind of what happens if you go to a public university isn't today, isn't that one of the things that you learn is the acceptance of all people, you know, the acceptance of all worldviews. Yet yeah, instead, what's occurred is the love of many is waxing cold. Matthew 24. <laughs> this, yeah. So this, I mean, this is tolerance where, you know, if my candidate loses up to 20 percent, again, this is just the, the folks at LSU doing this study. OK, but what about the news? I think that violence is justified. The That's news is pushing the buttons, though. And with AI, AI is actually manufacturing the news feed that you get to your computer uh, based on what they think you're going to respond to. McBrayer says that a key contributor to the move towards civil war is the inflaming of the masses with fake news. And of course, that's the, the, what his book is about. So I think we'll have the opportunity to sort of weigh whether it's fake news or other contributing factors. We'll get to weigh that in our conversation with him. Uh, but certainly, as I reflect on uh, the Strauss and Howe thematics of the fourth turning, it, I think it makes fake news a coincidence in the larger historical context. Maybe it's a part of what happens or is happening. And yes, I think it does contribute to hyper-partisanship. I think we'd still be at a similar place in history, even if we didn't have it. You bring up Neil Howe, and what a fascinating guest. But, you know, a person who was highly influenced by Neil Howe in the fourth turning was Steve Bannon. And Neil told you on the commentary, he said, you know, Steve's not really, Steve Bannon's not really driven towards conservative politics or liberal politics. His main driver is the interest in changing culture. That's his main driver is changing culture. So in a way, mainstream media or whatever method that's being used is really just like adding heat to this partisanship, is it not? <laughs> I no, I see this. I see this with my kids on occasion, like somebody's going to poke somebody until they scream or just go crazy. 
right? Just to and see if they can. Right. Yeah. And I think it's the Bannon like sensation of let's just see if we can change culture here. Like what's going to happen if we, and, and there, there's, there's no commitment to a set of ideals. It's more of just change for change sake. And I would suggest that a lot of unrest can occur without civil war entering the equation. And again, we go back to 68 and 69, and these are not times of peace. I mean, we had bombs going off here in the United States. We had what we didn't have a word for at the time, domestic terrorism. We had people being shot on college campuses. We had all kinds of crazy stuff happening in this period of time. And you could have argued that, you know, things were going to boil over. And if you've ever watched a pot of noodles, it will boil over. Mm-hmm. And you know that it will continue if you don't turn down the heat. That's when you run into the kitchen. Yeah, you've got to turn it down or it'll just completely yeah, boil so, over. And, and it's it, this is probably easier said than done. But we should all be seeking at this point more light than heat. We, we don't need more heat. Our problems, frankly, are not partisan. They're structural in nature. I go back to the original contention that Peter Turchin was talking about. And, and yeah, it, we, there is an issue. There's an issue with a lot of college graduates and looking at the jobs and saying, are we going to be able to pay off our student loans? A stagnating wages since the 1970s, exploding public debt, a widening gap between the elites and, and the common man. It, granted, there's only 2,200 billionaires in the world, but still, I mean, it, it, there's there's a lot of billions. In fact, there's quite a few trillions tied up in that little pocket of wealth. And it's enough. It's enough for people to say, is this working for me? But there's a pretty solid choice here. If you don't want to see an escalation in unrest, then be deliberate about taking every conversation, every interaction off the boil. Dave, as you know, we have some clients that run a company that they fly all over the country and they teach large organizations and casinos and hospitals and various various institutions, the employees of those institutions, how to react if there's an active shooter or if there's you know a situation where you have violence of whatever kind. And uh, I talked to one of these men uh, yesterday, actually, and uh, they teach this de-escalation uh, technique. Uh, he says it's much harder with the mask. With the mask, when you can't see the face, it's, it's much harder to de-escalate. But what a noble drive is to try to teach people how to de-escalate a situation in a period of time, Dave, where the media and others are trying to escalate everything. Right. And I do think that that boils down to a partisan priority to divide. And that's an accusation that I'd level equally to Republicans and Democrats. Well, and you, pun intended, when you said boils down to, you've already used the boils uh, (laughs) analogy, but you're right. It boils down to people who, and you brought this up in the last couple of months, the people who benefit from escalating a situation. Yeah, and I think our problems stem from an aggregation of poor choices. And this is this is where you, when you look at legacy issues, whether it's legacy baggage or what we have and are grateful for from previous generations, you're dealing with an aggregation of either good choices or bad choices, an aggregation of poor choices, an aggregation of compromises, an aggregation of outright policy mistakes from Washington, D.C. And again, this is not one party. This is both parties. It's the political machine itself. It's the Leviathan. And it's the financing of that Leviathan via the Treasury and the Fed. Well, and not just the Treasury and the Fed. I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon at this point. Look how the Europeans reacted to the global financial crisis. It was print more money. The Japanese, look how they reacted. Look at how the Chinese are reacting. The massive debt that they're taking on at this point to make things look normal. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, sometimes you and I in our conversations off to the side will will go back to books that we've read. And last night we were talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh and how there's I mean, you could boil the world down to city folk and country folk and this desire for either freedom or control. And, and there's a certain elegance to control. Everything runs very efficiently and smoothly. Uh, but that's what we've been promoting. Is- yeah. And the agenda changes. Like even with the mainstream media, if if city state is the goal, then city state's going to be the motive. You want peace in the city state, even at the expense of the individual or the individual's rights and wealth. Right. And even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I mean, this is something that's that predates the Bible as a piece of literature that says there's still this divide between two kinds of people, mm. someone who prioritizes freedom and someone who prioritizes. 
prioritizes the pristine and controlled environment. And, and so, I mean, I, I think the issue, as you say, the issue has become global because you've got policymakers who've agreed that control is the better route and we do want something that is polished. And so what they've unfortunately done is they've repeated the same poor choices and policy mistakes as those in the West. You've got Reuters who reminds us this week of dollar denominated debt in emerging markets surpassing $4 trillion this week. And actually it was the Bank of International Settlements doing the research on it. And Reuters just putting it together. But the Bank of International Settlements charts this 7% year on year growth in that pool of obligations. And when you think about it, any large pool of debt is just the aggregation of poor choices. You couldn't afford it, but you bought it anyways. And you do that over and over and over again, and that's how you end up with $4 trillion. Well, low interest rates are the that's sort of the bait, though, isn't it? I mean, in a way, even when people buy a car, it'll say, okay, well, it's 0% for the first three months or, or what have you. Are the low interest rates worldwide a large-scale worm on a hook? Yeah, the policy blunder is incentivized. and you're tempted by low interest rates, particularly in a foreign jurisdiction. So we've lowered our rates here in the United States. Our central bank has done that using its balance sheet to buy down the rate of interest. Interest rates are low today, and that's what they would call, I would call, the initial temptation. That's the worm. That's right. the worm. That is right. not, yeah. Now, in finance, it. in finance circles, it's the next step that's considered the quote unquote original sin. Because you're choosing to finance debt, the obligations require repayment in a foreign currency. And that's the killer. Don't denominate your debt in someone else's currency. Mm -hmm. Iceland was destroyed financially by taking advantage of low rates in Switzerland. So imagine if you're financing a house in Iceland and want to do it with basically a zero interest rate with a Swiss bank, forgetting that the Icelandic krona is, is different than the Swiss franc. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, we went through a period of time where the Swiss franc appreciated, the krona depreciated, and the debt became unpayable. Okay, but when those currencies, yeah, when those currencies change values, as long as Europeans are borrowing in dollars and the dollars are falling relative to the euro, that's not a bad thing. But what happens if the dollar strengthens? And that's where we're at today. So, so nobody's worrying about it. There's probably a great argument for the U.S. dollar declining in here. And so in the short run, there's no added pressure on emerging markets. Well, yeah, borrowers. not just Europe. It's emerging markets that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. $4 trillion of emerging market debt is denominated in U.S. dollars. If the U.S. dollar ever strengthens relative to those emerging market currencies, the, the burden of that debt compounds negatively. And so, again, we come back to this structural issue, and there will be people impoverished in this, right? And there's political consequences to it. But I love that quote that you shared in the early part, because this is where you see the consequence of policymakers as it gets played out over time. Policymakers choose the expedient without regards to the future issues and consequences that emerge. Your background is philosophy. And one of the key elements of philosophy is the question, what is truth? And how do you know what truth is? And uh, I know when you're talking to our guest here in a couple of weeks, Justin, his area is philosophy as well. But the question of truth is becoming more and more difficult. Let me ask you, if we allow ourselves to be played by these partisan extremes, are we going to be blind to actual truth? Yeah, and I, I think this is where voters often fall prey to political rhetoric. And politicians are very skilled at redirecting frustration and animus away from inept and, and, and you could even describe them as corrupt policies and towards their fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this is, this is, they get to do this every two to four years. The reality of polarization is that partisan politicians benefit from the energy that polarization creates, even if it does tear apart our social construct. And I, I, I think Trump has done this. And I don't think either one of them are innocent from that. So I think you've got individuals who end up seeing each other as enemies instead of neighbors. And, and truth is something that becomes a casualty in the race to grab power. That's how politicians operate. But what if truth is being blocked? See, that that's the thing that really this last week has been amazing to me because there's a story that's come out. We don't even have to go into detail. But that story, like National Public Radio said, we're just not going to report on that story. Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, we're not going to report on that story. Do you not have the right at least to determine 
based on the news that's out there, what the truth is, rather than just be denied completely the story at all. Information block is, is kind of an interesting thing. And, and you might say, well, that's an issue there. That's they're, they're being generous to us. They're doing the work for us in terms of sorting out what is fake news and not fake news. That would be one argument. Matt Taibbi, do you remember that name? Mm, he, he was an award-winning journalist in Rolling Stone. Um, he was the one who, I mean, he's done some great reporting on Wall Street, very critical reporting on Wall Street. And I have probably written six or seven bestsellers oh, I think since tried, 2008. What, yeah, what was the name of that guy? We read the article. He described that. Goldman Sachs as a vampire yes. squid. Right? Okay, that was him, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this week he's livid, livid that Twitter and Facebook opts to shut down any information flow on Hunter Biden's laptop. He, he said that suppression is a bigger scandal than the actual story. I agree. Yeah, you've got the New York Post, a 200-year-old newspaper getting blocked. You know, again, kind of speaking of, of, of truth as a casualty of politics. And he says this, the least curious people in the country right now appear to be the credentialed news media, a situation normally unique to tin-pot authoritarian societies. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, wow. OK, right. Give me good reporting and bad reporting and let me sort it out. But if you're starting to curate for me what you want me to see or don't want me to see and expect me to believe that that's being done on an unbiased basis. It reminds us of what's going on in the markets this last 10 years. No longer do you know the price of something because the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank, they've determined the price because they came in and bought it out from under you. And so in a way, prices don't match truth any more than news stories are matching truth at this point. Well, Taibbi also says that whether it's Fox or the Daily Caller on the right or left leaning outlets like Consortium or the World Socialist website to writers like me, even we're all now clearly in range of new speech restrictions, even if we stick to long established factual standards. You brought up 1968. Okay. And so 1968, if you just step back and be objective about it, not the issues, you can see the unrest, but actually it was the end of a cycle. So these are end of cycle indicators. That's right. It's, it, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, vitriol, there's an unsettledness in an end of cycle period. So, I mean, Based in large part on the radical difference in life experiences people have, you can see coming at things from different perspectives. And I, to me, you look at the markets today, this is the most distorted the markets could be. I mean, if you could possibly imagine, you get COVID, which is providing the pretext for shutting down the world. The global economy has moved to gridlock with the exception of these interventionist measures. And so the economy is not matched up with market pricing. Market pricing is reflective of this interventionism. The greater the credit measures, the closer to normal things seem, at least in terms of pricing of assets. So real estate looks healthy, the stock market looks healthy, the bond market looks healthy, and yet you've got this internal conversation, which is really rancorous, and a difference between what people experience and what people see on paper. And it's a pretty radically different thing. So the more interventionist the measures the bigger the moves in asset prices, only exaggerating the difference between the very well off and those who are just barely making it. And so the question comes, just like we've asked decade after decade, when does the piper get paid? Because if the interventionist measures work and if credit measures work, then we're missing the party, Dave. Well, I know. And, and, and I think there is an argument that the party is just going to continue. Yeah. And I, I read a Financial Times article by Ray Dalio. He's the head of Bridgewater, invests for his uh, client base, $100, $150 billion in assets, one of the largest hedge fund managers in the world. And he makes the case in this Financial Times article that China is an attractive place to consider investing right now. And Never I, and mind I, the debt. Never mind well, the and debt. Well, I, th I, th yeah. I thought it was fascinating that the case for China was based on their robust recovery. And the command and control dynamics, they are more effective in what they are able to orchestrate, far superior to ours. We control the vertical. We control the horizontal. We borrow money, but we control the vertical. I, we I know. control the horizontal. It, and, control. And there was not even a mention, not even a mention of the over $5 trillion credit expansion in China year to date. Just 
this year. No, just this year. No mention of the state pushing out credit via the banks like a fireman pushes out water from a hose. Right. I mean, the, the, the piece was not an exploration of on the one hand and on the other. This, this, this was not an exploration of risk and reward. I mean, in all likelihood, it was an opportunity to talk up positions he already has taken. Hmm. But, but th- there was no mention of the credit dynamics in one of the world's greatest credit bubbles of all time. I mean, what was missing was, in fact, the elephant in the room. So we can pretend that bubble dynamics are the new normal and let our guard down, that there, there's money to be made in that respect. And, and maybe that's the case. Maybe China is, is going to be the next growth story, 2021, and undervalued stocks moving to an overvalued status. But at the end of a cycle, there's even more money to be lost. Mm. I would argue that there's a generation's worth of wealth at stake. And, and the allure of more, the appetite that grows with the eating, it tempts us to overstay. It tempts us to indulge. And as Dalio does, justify a new model of capitalism. I mean, you, you should read the Financial Times article. You read it and you go, nothing in my heart and in my mind or in my intellectual framework is anti-China. But I'm reading this going, this isn't a very critical piece. Uh, you know, th- this new model of capitalism, it's not just creditism. Okay, so it's not what just what Duncan says. No, no, no. This is the command and control dynamics, which should be appealing at this point. And this goes back to Russell Napier's lament from three or four years ago on our commentary. That echoes in my mind. The free markets are dying. And, and the only way to allow for the free markets to rejuvenate is to allow them to die. And we won't do that. That's the nature of a bear market. It's a shadow of death experience that revitalizes the landscape, right? right? So whether it's it's, a form of healthy, a bear market's healthy if allowed to run. Right. Either gravity is going to bring the shadow or political uncertainty will. But as the world was shaken in that 68 to 69 period. It's not an unfortunate event for that to happen okay. again. So let's, let's, because remember, the world never came to an end. It didn't, but let's do a thought experiment here because there was a guy named Orwell who talked about command and control. Now he was just a little early. He was a little early, but we've talked about the news cycle being command and control and Facebook and Twitter and national public radio and some of these other outlets literally banning certain stories coming out. So in other words, the narrative for the city state this goes back to the gilgamesh thing the narrative for the city state may be trying to reach some sort of consensus it doesn't matter whether it's true or not it's consensus the market's doing the same thing we've got to see the parallel so instead of reaching consensus for the city state wouldn't you rather be in a room of people who disagree with you but they've thought it through well and and i mean if you're going back to the age of you know the austrian coffee house where Intellectuals would gather, smoke cigarettes, probably nonstop, and drink espresso nonstop. And, right. And Ludwig von Mises, Gödel, all these I, genius and, guys. And they just have it out. They, yeah. they, this was this was an atmosphere of debate and conversation. And yeah, Young, Young was there too. You know, these Austrian coffee houses. It was an intellectual fantasy land if you were willing to talk to people who you disagreed with. Now, sometimes it got bad. I mean, Cambridge, you and I were talking about Wittgenstein and uh, Popper in the 1940s. They, they would not. He, he took a, a poker from the fireplace and actually chasing chased him around the room. Yeah, yeah. So there there can be a difference. But, uh, but yeah, what about active debate? Everybody getting information. In other words, not trying to control the information for the city-state. And then actively debating, even if it risks a friendship, even if it risks a relationship. Yeah, I think Wittgenstein was basically trying to say, falsify this as he jabbed him (laughs) with the poker. Um, No, but this was a great week for our wealth management team. And I say that because I do love dialogue and debate. And And it can get hot sometimes, can't it? I mean, uncomfortably hot. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And and I I mean, I love differing perspectives. And and as we each created our own matrix for the election, various outcomes and the implications for particular asset classes, I was reminded of the importance of this kind of robust interaction. Mm -hmm. We are a team. We are going somewhere together. We are trying to solve similar problems, even though we come at those problems with different educational backgrounds, with different life experiences, and a different set of personal insights. So when I sat down and wrote out my opinions on a page, they were firm, they were defensible, 
they were what I think was the best reflection of what lies ahead. Okay, but here's what you do. Here's what you do. And this is different than like the academics who have to defend a paper for the rest of their life. You then listen. You listen to these folks. And when you listen, you realize there is a huge risk in approaching things from one perspective because you lose a comprehensive view. You miss nuance. You race past assumptions that you've made believing they're reasonable, but can in fact be overturned when scrutinized by others, right? So teamwork starts with respect. Right. And I wouldn't value the opinions of the people on our wealth management team. I wouldn't value their opinions to overturn my own. Some of these people you've known half of your adult life. Right, but I, I have respect for each of them. And so I listen and I'm willing to change my mind. It's not that I come in with a soft view on things, but I'm willing to change my mind if they can give me a good reason to. On top of that, as you mentioned, this is not an academic project where ego might drive the defense of a thesis. I, I don't need to go off a cliff holding on to something that I hold dear. Yeah, don't you love the markets? Okay, if, if you've never been humbled, go try to get into the markets with your opinions. Yeah, the markets give you immediate feedback. Right and wrong is a little different in the sphere of asset management. You may think, well, but you don't want to be morally corrupt. You have to know the difference between right and wrong. Okay, I understand. There is a, a distinction between being morally correct and morally incorrect. I, I, that's a slightly different conversation. Sure, you sure. can't claim the high ground in the marketplace if the ground is falling out from underneath you. So as you say, bring humility to the effort, the market's going to bring it to you. Could you imagine if politics was played the same way? If you actually had, they talk about bipartisanship, but they don't mean it. If politics actually was pursued to solve a problem where you had Democrats and Republicans working toward the same goal, it'd be like the markets. I mean, it'd either work or it wouldn't, but you'd have guys as a team working towards something. And one of the differences, of course, is that the feedback loop within the realm of politics and public policy is much longer. It may take quarters or years or even decades to see the implications of bad policy. And then you need to be reelected before that time. And so, yeah, so much time goes by in between the dialogue, the discussion, the debate, the implementation of the policy and the actual consequences of it, right? So with the market, you get a very short feedback loop. I could know within the next five minutes if I was right or wrong. Certainly I'll know within the next five days or five weeks. Right. So reflecting on how we must operate as a team, Right? This, there's a difference versus the approach to problem solving in the area of politics. I mean, the contrast, I think, is day and night. Rather than seeing ourselves on the same team, if you go to the area of partisan politics, voters see themselves as members of different tribes. Animal instincts start kicking in. Zero sum game. About. Zero sum gain structures. So you're talking about interests. You're talking about priorities. You're talking about limited resources. And, you know, this is like, you know, watching you know, planet Earth with my kids and, and, and listening to David Attenborough explain to me why a band of baboons, or I forget, maybe it was chimpanzees. It, it, it's exactly like the election cycle. There's no difference here. We have our trees with food. We will kill to keep the other monkeys out of the tree. Hmm. And it's tribalism. Tribalism is reinforced. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I can't help but think again about what failures there are in, in the area of education where, where we have been taught to celebrate diversity. We have been taught to look through the world of multiculturalism, and yet there's really not a lot of celebration or invitation into unity and diversity. Again, you look at how politics plays this out. I'm familiar with the team dynamic. Yeah. I'm a part of men and women from different parts of the country with different ethnic backgrounds. We start with respect. We build out a robust dialogue on the basis of, and actually the value, there's value in the difference of opinion. Well, you know, we're, I have to go not, back to what you're talking same. about. Okay. We're not the same. The people with the bumper sticker that say diversity are almost always the people that will immediately tell you that what you believe is wrong. Have you noticed that? Well, so, and that's what, yeah, that's the more what we pursue at, that. This is, there's an irony in that the more we celebrate diversity and, and teach multiculturalism, the more we underscore tribalism. And I'm not exactly sure how that happens, but mm. it seems like it actually, in some weird way, reinforces it. Actually, I see this, you know, NYU. NYU is considering segregated housing for their African-American students. 
how weird is this that we go from segregation being an issue that we want to fight to segregation now being the only way that we can celebrate diversity? What in the world are we talking about? Right? New York University wants to segregate students, and 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 this is this is in response to so what how we acknowledge the legitimate no bona fides of the Black Lives Matters. Oh, Black Lives Matter so much we're going to segregate. What what happened in the six the earlier part of the sixties? I mean, what in the world? One of the things uh, about the team, the wealth management team, Dave, is you're not the same. You come at this with so many different backgrounds and different attitudes, and actually even belief in different political outcomes coming up through this election. That's been fascinating because it does emotionally you can't help but react to a degree because you're a human. But that emotion, if you can just step past that and say, you know what, I respect you. Like you said, I respect you. Keep talking. I'll keep listening. Right. And of course, we're trying to achieve the best possible results for our clients. The value comes from being forced to reassess all that you believe in light of someone else's beliefs. You could be wrong. Someone else is likely to have an insight which you don't. And so much of politics is different than that. It's about power cooperation and team dynamics, they disappear. What we know in terms of a healthy working relationship on the wealth management team, imagine if power comes into play, Mm -hmm. right? Allow power dynamics to dominate. What you end up with is the same thing you see in partisan politics. It's at the expense of social cohesion. It's at the expense of respect, right? To a politician, unfortunately, then a voter is a necessary pawn in the game of power. Line them up, use them according to the needs of the larger end game. Right. But make sure that you get what you need. And yes, it is something like the chimpanzee zero sum game. Get out of my tree. It's my fruit now. I was talking to a client the other day and we were talking about uh, the the short fund and McIlvenny Wealth Management in gold versus silver, platinum, palladium. And he started to realize that we're not all in lockstep, even here in the company, that we have the freedom. And we always have for the last 33 years that I've been here. I have had the freedom to think for myself and make recommendations based on what I feel a client needs versus some sort of ideological totalitarianism. (laughs) You know, you have never behaved, Dave, and your dad didn't either, as if we have to all be in lockstep and giving the same advice to everybody because you do respect varying opinions. And, uh, you know, I, I think what we ought to do is Let's just summarize some of the things that have worked and some of the things that don't work. What does that look like when we all talk? And maybe we don't agree, but we come to some sort of decision that's tested by the markets. Yeah. I mean, what we're anticipating is next week, there is going to be an outcome. Is it a a Biden victory and uh, then red Senate? Is it a complete blue wave sweep? Is it a Trump victory with the blue Senate or is it a red wave sweep? I mean, you've got various outcomes and there's various impacts. One thing we know without a doubt is that there's still a lot of monetary accommodation. Uh, regardless of who wins. Yeah, both parties. Both parties are printing money. And there's not a lot of difference in terms of the fiscal policy initiatives. There's probably a half trillion dollar difference between uh, the Trump initiatives that get put in place and initiatives that would be inspired by and sanctioned by a blue wave. So an extra half trillion going to states and municipalities, if you wanted to just simplistically say that's really the difference is three trillion as a base case for a blue wave, two and a half trillion for a red wave. And again, we could get finer into the details, but in either case, what you're talking about is events which are dollar negative, gold positive, treasury negative, muni negative in the cases of a red wave, muni positive in the case of, of, of a blue wave. We know that there is an impact to corporate taxes, corporate tax rates and individual tax rates. So blue wave ends up being a little bit more hostile to the stock investor versus the red wave, which JP Morgan's base case now is uh, with a Trump victory. You've got a minimum S&P 3600, probably stretching to 3900 by the end of 2021. Okay. So if you get all that, what you just now said, what I'm thinking is I need to do what Barton Biggs did. And that is just go get a place, exit the system for a little while and enjoy God's green earth. Uh, what, what do you do? I mean, obviously, this is a minefield. What you just now said, Dave, any listener who's listening to that is going to be going, OK, so what do I do next? 
some pundits will say, look, it's not even worth saying what the outcomes will be. Does it really matter? And they'll reference under Obama, we had 130 new highs in the stock market. And under Trump, we had 130 new highs in the stock market. In the end, does it matter? Mm. In the end, does it matter? Right. And I think what is different this time as dangerous as it is to say those words, is that we are at the end of a cycle. We're at the end of a cycle such that if you continue with trillions of dollars in fiscal spending, which I think COVID necessitates, COVID and the stimulus packages are going to happen this next year. You're talking about a threshold event in terms of the dollar. And there is a knock-on effect for the treasury market and how it doesn't end up being neutral. You can't say the treasury market is somehow a good way of hedging risk against equities, not when you're at this threshold event in terms of a reappraisal of credit risk and dollar valuation risk. So if Jacques Roof were here, okay, the monetary sin of the West, 1968, 69, 70, 71, there was a fork in the road. We did not keep the gold standard. Uh, Charles de Gaulle was not listened to. The European Union ultimately never was a gold-backed currency. But if Jacques were in the studio right now, would he look at us and say, if you're not going to go to a worldwide gold standard, you better put yourself on a personal gold standard. Now, I know this sounds like an advertisement, but Dave, this company, we've done this now for almost 50 years for one reason, and that is an ounce of gold still buys a year of bread at a loaf of bread a day. 365 loaves of bread. I just got off a conversation before we walked in here and he says, call me when there's a buying opportunity on gold. Well, this is a guy who needs some. Okay. He does not have enough. And I said, well, I'm not going to call you because this is a buying opportunity on gold. Right now, an ounce of gold buys almost exactly 365 loaves of bread. So this is the time to step aside because what you just now said, as far as various outcomes, the outcome is already so uncertain. I have no idea how you would actually place a bet before this election. seems to me like you would want to take betting off of the table. Well, I think it's only fair to say there's really two phases from an investor standpoint coming into next week. Phase one is is starting on the third and going through the inauguration. Let's call it a 30 to 45 day window, a short term phase. And there's going to be volatility of one sort or another. And I wonder if that doesn't capture our attention more, but actually it's less important. What happens in the next 300 days following that right. is the really longer critical. Horizon. The, longer the longer horizon, horizon is really critical because yeah. that, that's where, again, it's, it's not just the markets reacting to a surprise. I mean, would a red wave be a surprise? To the market, it would be. So I think that's worth remembering, the two phases. Short term, there's going to be a reaction to the event. Beyond that, there is an adjustment. And the adjustment is, in light of the new landscape, what does it mean? And again, if that means corporate taxes are higher or corporate taxes are lower, if that means individual taxes are higher or individual taxes are lower, if that means the new Green Deal or some alternative which is more pro-U.S. energy. I mean, th there will be a divergence. There is clearly a difference in terms of policy mandates. When I've said that there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats, basically I'm talking about <laughs> abuse of power and use of free capital from the Treasury market and the Federal Reserve. Sure, there are issue differences that are very, very important to you. But as far as money printing goes, and it the, goes both and, ways. And the implications for the financial markets. Yeah. I think this is where all of a sudden, if you follow sort of the liquidity theory of asset pricing, this is where there's not much of a difference. Where you will see is is sector specific differences. We talked about muni positive, muni negative. There being a very different view there. Natural resource positive, natural resource negative. Very different there if you're talking about select energy assets, which, you know, clearly Biden's not for promoting. Once you're just listening to this, Dave, this is why you need a team that argues. Unless you're an expert in the markets yourself and you want to do your own money management, you know, the McIlvaney Wealth Management team, they do argue with each other, but they come at it from years and years and years of experience. And so, you know, going back to ideological totalitarianism, you don't have that in the team, but it actually, in the end, is very, very healthy. I think one of the prayers we're going to have to have is that we don't have ideological totalitarianism in the political realm or the social realm, where any other view other than the accepted one is wrong. That's not diverse. Yeah, I think it's worth clarifying. When I say argue, we're talking about rigorous 
generous engagement. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, you love each is, other. <laughs> the, de- the, the, yeah. the debates are about the issues on the table, not about the people promoting them. And so the ad hominem attack is never an appropriate ad. Well, to, and you and your dad would do that. Growing up, you and your dad would do that. And then you'd you'd just hug and walk away. You know, you guys would go do something else. But you would you, you didn't always agree. Right. And I, I, th- I think that idea of ideological totalitarianism, it's fortified. It's it's reinforced in the current paradigm. I mean, if someone doesn't agree with you, they don't accept the same paradigm that you do. They They read the fact through a different lens and say, well, your facts are different than mine because you don't see things the way that I do. Or you're dealing with fake news and I'm dealing with the truth. We need to be able to engage and not move towards writing someone off, right? And assuming that they're uneducated and uninformed with a blanket accusation like you're a socialist, Hmm. end of conversation. You're a racist, end of conversation. Expand the dialogue, expand the conversation. If you do have a simple phrase which becomes weaponized, which, you know, threatens social ostracism or or has consequences to it, like that implied argument of have you stopped beating your wife lately? Right. You know, it kills any hope of dialogue. It, it kills any conversation. It kills any sense of possibility that we can, as neighbors, disagree, agree to disagree and do it on, on friendlier terms. You can't make progress if you're a racist, I'm a socialist, and we just can't talk anymore. All we can do is hate each other and hope for violence to or death to come via COVID. I mean, th- those statistics earlier were actually kind of <laughs> bothering. Social media, of course, exaggerates the trends towards those unfiltered, knee-jerk responses, kind of verbal tyranny, if you will. And I think this is where both the right and the left need to calm down. De-escalate. They need to de-escalate. You know, we don't have to go this direction one way or another. We can. You know, we should encourage our listeners. It, this doesn't mean that you have to give up your issues. No. But de-escalate. Okay. Try to solve the problem instead of make it worse. I always thought it was funny. When, we, when, when, when I was in college and somebody said, well, if you're going to have a beer with somebody, you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics, and you don't talk about philosophy. And, and I, I would always respond, well, then what do you talk about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly <laughs> Because right. I'm not assuming that escalation is a part of the conversation. I'm assuming that there's a reasonable engagement, a generous engagement. It's something to learn something, for both parties. There's something to learn from everyone. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And you can call us at 800 525 Nine five five six. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.